in attendance, and we'd like to welcome our new board member, Ms. Zick. Oh, I'm sorry, Zick Washington. I'm sorry. There we go. Okay. Uh, all right. A few things and, have changed. Yeah, a few couple yeah. things. All right. And uh, approval of the agenda. Would someone like to make a motion? I will make a motion to approve the agenda. Thank you very much, Ms. Robinson. Motion has been made. Do we have a second? I have a second that motion. Thank you very much, Ms. Peterson. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, all in favor, raise hand and or aye. Any opposed? And seeing none, motion carries unanimously 620. And the reading of our vision and mission statement, our vision statement is to provide a rigorous education that empowers our students to confidently navigate in our ever-changing world. Yes. And our new mission through the lens of excellence, equity, and engagement, we are dedicated to empowering every student with the essential skills to build a foundation for lifelong learning. All right. So now let's go on to our item number two, our business office uh, reports and update. Mr. Klimek. I don't have a prepared business office update this week. I'll just share with you uh, one of the things, I some of the items we're going to talk about in separate agenda items. Um, but I did, will just mention to you that I did... Um, attend the Wasbo Fall Conference this past uh, week on Thursday and Friday up in Elkhart Lake. And one uh, of the overarching themes was about health insurance and the challenges that school districts are finding in um, a very less competitive health insurance market. And you're starting to see the situation where healthcare companies are buying insurance, are buying the insurance plans as well. And so, um, districts are having less and less choices. And we discovered that as well this year when we went out to market where we didn't have, um, we had uh, only one other bidder when we tried to uh, see if we could reduce our costs. So what districts are starting to pursue is a self-insurance model um, where the district actually runs its own insurance um, program in that sense. Um, and sometimes partners with other entities or other districts to kind of um, become a larger entity so that um, insurance companies are more likely, or health, healthcare companies are more likely to um, to work with them when it comes to pricing. So that is something that um, NIS has been talking to me about over the last couple of years, but um, we'll have to continue to look at it because as you know, right now we we have um, WCA Group Health Trust, um, which is which is um, the back end of which is through United Healthcare. So United Healthcare will never bid against them. So we'll be limited in our, in our options going forward. And again, like we said Humana uh, left the market this year. Uh, WEA left the market, so um, we we are going. It's going to be more and more challenging for uh, districts to um, have uh, access to high quality insurance. So we're going to something we'll be starting to talk about uh, this year. So Kevin, so for all intents and purposes, there's only two really major players in the insurance industry right now that are, are even willing to take on uh, school district insurance. Well, um, the the other firms that we went well, we went out. The bid and three other firms were were uh, um, offers were made to them. Uh, Anthem, Blue Cross, uh, which declined to bid on us. Uh, WPS is another one that uh, declined to bid on us, and then Network Health was the one that we I brought to comparative pricing. But at this time, Network Health has a much more limited network. Um, it doesn't include Aurora as an example, and we knew that would be a you know an impact on our family. So realistically, I didn't consider that necessarily a, a full option for us to pursue. So. Um, that was part of our decision to remain with WCA, even though we experienced a 13 and a half percent increase in those premiums. So I would think that other school districts are probably experiencing the same thing that we are right now. So have we thought about potentially partnering with other districts so that that way the, the bigger the number of uh, the bigger the pool of numbers, the more likely an insurance agency is willing, potentially willing to. Uh, taking on that contract. So have we thought about that? Well, it is. It, there's the insurance side or, or if it is going self-funded, you know, where you basically, the difference being is that you take out the insurance company and you you assume more of the risk. Um, so that that's the, the, the hard part. It's basically that the district would hire a third-party administrator to handle the claim work. And that would be an independent firm that would do that. And then we would be paying all the claims and we would be doing all of that part but the difference is, is that when you have good years, the profit that goes to the insurance company stays with the district. So if you can then, you have more control, if you can bend the curve to some extent um, through a wellness program by, you know, encouraging employees to, you know, pursue a healthy lifestyles, 
and you can change, you know, what your claim history is like, the district is the beneficiary of it. And then we can set the premium the following year based on what our what our experience has been. There are a number of districts, um, often larger, I mean, certainly larger than us, um, that are moving to that model, but there are some that are it's starting to trickle down to smaller and smaller entities. Now, is there a possibility that, say, a bunch of North Shore districts could get together and make a decision to do that? Um, that's certainly a possibility. Part of it will depend on uh, being all aligned with same kind of coverage as you may want and what you want to offer. So we have to have those conversations. But I think I think it's something that will will probably be you know if it, not that we necessarily do it next year, but I think it's something that we'll have to continue to look at and something that you may see a shift um, across school districts and other entities over the course of the next few years. And only bad thing about that one is that if we win an insurance company, we know exactly what we're going to end up paying, what we're going to have to pay. With this one right here, we don't necessarily really know. So if we ended up it's one of those years where we have an absorbent amount of claims. There is there is another layer you add with a stop loss coverage. So you do you do um, you do purchase a small insurance plan that would basically handle your worst possible cases, um, and that's again part of the formula of what it costs to to have the insurance. So a lot of numbers uh, that are involved in trying to decide it. But again, it, it the the possibility of being able to control that, and especially when you're uh, if we get to the point where we only have one option and the option is going to be 20 percent year after year after year and you have no control over that then that's something we'll you know i think you'll start to see other entities start to really look at that closely so all right uh thanks for thanks. So i just wanted to update you that was the, the uh, one big takeaway from from uh from that seminar i just went to several things that were talking about that and i just think it's a direction that districts will start to yeah and then yeah. we probably need to start trying to basically forecast out in the future and stuff, what this may look like, especially because of some of our other budgetary constraints and issues. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's it for the, that's the only thing I want to mention in the business office report. All right, uh, I didn't see anything about approval of new hires. I didn't see any. No new hires this week. Uh, resignations, I didn't yeah, see anything no. for resignations. All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll take that. All right, so Wash. All right, so Mr. Clement, we'll go to E, approval of the 23-24 cash flow Line of yeah, great. Yeah, I, I would like to say that because we had no new hires, the right patient by my week was easier, but it really was. So, um, so the next piece, yes, is uh, the short term cash uh, bar. I sent an executive summary uh, to the board. Uh -huh. If you remember last year, we did the same thing, we, we did do a line of credit um, for the first time. Historically, we had done a, a year long borrow, that number has dropped, had dropped over time. And the year, the, my first year here, we did a million dollars. Um, last year we did a line of credit. We never touched the line of credit, um, but it was part of the, uh, it was just a little bit of a safety net for us to make sure we had funds available. I'd like to do that again. Our cash right now is a little bit lower than it was last year at this time. Um, and, uh, you know, part of the speed and how much money we have is how fast we can claim um, some of the federal funding, because obviously with ESSER funding being a big chunk of our of our budget, um, it's how fast we can, we can spend the money to then claim it and get reimbursed. So, um, for that reason, uh, I wanted to pursue this again. I found an option through uh, Corals, which we've used before for bond counsel for the feasments and other things uh, when we work with Baird. Um, so I, I reached out to them and they uh, were going to do this for a, a relatively um, inexpensive amount. It was uh, $2,500. Some there, depends on the final, uh, how the closing goes, but it'll be between $2,500 and $3,000. Last year we paid $7,500 um, for that cost, so it saves us a little bit there. And then they did suggest that we, you know, basically put it up to bid. Um, so I reached out to several uh, larger banks. Uh, the reality is that I know um, uh, Ms. Robinson asked about this last year. The reality is, is that um, if you don't have a deposit relationship with the bank, they're not really going to do anything for you. And so even Associated, which we have, uh, they do some of our bond work and and that uh, they they said it would be too expensive for us to do it. If you were a depository, we do this for free for you. So. You know, we'll, 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 I'll certainly talk to anybody just to see what, the, you know, I've kind of inherited the bank situation that we're in, but, um, but I wanted to at least uh, pursue that. So what, what I did, though, I did get two responses. One was from BMO, which is our primary deposit holder where our main checking account is, and then Tri-City National Bank, which uh, has our student funds, our, sorry, our um, school activity funds, our house there and uh, over on the, um, the office on Bradley uh Bradley Road, and uh, we got two responses. Um, and I, I shared with you uh, just a quick chart of what the differences are between the two um, the two offers. Uh, the, the biggest difference is uh, the, the 
maximum interest rate. The, the two interest rates are calculated differently, but uh, they're basically going to probably track almost identically or within a few hundredths of a point with each other. Um, the maximum interest rate with um, Tri City National is um, uh, uh, a little less, eighteen percent. Uh, BMO is twenty five percent. Again, I, I'm not anticipating that uh, interest rates are going to skyrocket in the next ninety days, which is when we would use and pay back these funds if we decide to do it. So I don't know that's a big deal, but it is there. Um, the, the one other piece is that there is um, BMO did have a unused commitment fee because they basically set the million dollars aside um, so that we have access to it at a moment's notice. Um, Tri City did not have that requirement uh, for that, so there is no there won't be any fees for not using it. So basically. Um, it'll be, you know, other than the cost we have for originating, if we don't use it, um, it'll be basically a, a no cost to us. So, um, so um, my recommendation at this point would be to, uh, to go with uh, Tri City National um, for the line of credit for twenty three point four. Yeah, I mean, just just looking at it, it, it seems like it would make a lot, lot more sense. And then the other piece, for me too, is if we went to the branch down here in Bradley, so it is Brown Deer. So yeah, I mean it's uh, that's obviously not mean international, but yeah, again, but, but yes, they have a local presence as well. So, yeah. um, and they obviously would like to see more of our business, and I'll certainly you know talk to them as well, and you know we can we can certainly look. But what's interesting is that I know the auditors had mentioned to me, you know, they kind of questioned where we had several different banks for different things, and they thought we could consolidate. But if you consolidate, then you have only one choice to do something like this. So, um, it make me think about that a little bit when we get through that process, but. Uh, but that would be the recommendation. Again, um, this is just to approve the vendor, and then I will reach out to Quarles tomorrow with the with the board selection. Um, and then they'll work on all the closing paperwork. And then at the next board meeting, you would approve the resolution to set up the line of credits, and then it would be completed by early November, and the funds would be available to us again. As I mentioned, the memo at low point would be around the end of the month. Right. So out of pocket for us would be the three thousand and the three thousand that we'd have to pay to Quarles. To be able to do that, and, 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 then, and then if we do borrow, then obviously we'd be paying interest on the money we borrow or the fund of the to borrow. But okay, again, I'm not anticipating we need to do it, but this I I, I want to have it available in case something un, unexpected happens. So, okay. Um. So, would you like for us to do the approval for this one this evening? Yes, you just would need to approve the selection of whatever bank you want as the um for the uh, cash flow line of credit. Right. So what we're going to just give us a quick second. Sure. You may. Yeah. Ready? All right. Someone would like to make a motion to approve the cash flow line of credit? I would like to make a motion um, to approve the selection of cash flow borrowing line credit proposal for Tri City National Bank for the 2324. All right. Thank you very much. A motion has been made. We have a second. I'll second. Thank you very much, Ms. Walker. Motion has been made and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? You can see none. All in favor will raise hand and or aye. Aye. Any opposed? And seeing that motion carries six to zero. Mr. Klimek, uh, you have Tri City. Thank you. All right. All right. That's question. Yeah, I did. Um, <laughs> oh, what, I saw you read it. If, if we don't have, if we don't have these, we will. Just, no. It's just a line of credit. It's just a line of credit. So we don't. We don't. If we don't. If we don't, if we don't, if we don't, we don't. There's no interest. We can pay it back and close it at any point in time. So. Okay. Thank yep. you. Yep, just like a, a home equity line credit. Got it. Got it. Okay. For next month. All right. So now let's go on to our next item is the 2324 budget update. Yes, I just want this is an informational item. Um, uh, in two weeks, I will present to you the full um, original budget for 2324, but there have been a couple things that have happened in the last few weeks just to give you um, kind of a head start or spare a little bit. Um, one of the things was that we completed our third Friday count, uh, which was held uh, on September 15th, and um, the numbers were down just a bit um, from what we had projected and from last year. We actually had anticipated about 10 students more. Um, we actually are down 29, 26, sorry, 26 students. And so um, what we, uh, or I apologize, 23 students. We're at 1629. I'm getting my numbers mixed up. Sorry. We're at 1,629. Uh, we were a little over 1,650 last year. Um, 
We did have an increase at the uh, middle school, or sorry, at the elementary school, uh, went up a few students. The middle school was basically flat. And now that considers the fact that we also added 16 open enrollment in students. So that's part of it being flat. It would be down a lot more if we hadn't done that. And then high school dropped by a, a little over 40 students. So that was the biggest, biggest drop. And in fact, uh, one of the things that I think drew my attention the most was, and I guess we had this conversation before about those transition grades. If you look at last year's eighth grade group, um, had 120 students. This year's freshman class had 117. So we actually didn't gain, um, you know, sometimes we gain people from outside coming in at, at ninth grade and we lose a few, um, but that was kind of a surprise to us. A little bit. So, so what was that like, what, six, that's like, so what, 60 students? A little bit more than 60 students? 44 um, at the high school? Yeah, from eighth grade going into ninth grade? Did you oh, no, no, it was, they were at 120 in eighth grade, now we're at 117. Oh, okay. So we lost three. Normally, if you look at previous years, and you have, if you go back too far, we added open enrollment seats in ninth grade. But you even look at last year where we didn't add open enrollment seats, we went from 124 to 145. All right. So what, what did the number go for in high school? 120 to 117. Oh, no. overall or that grade? High school. High school went to 400. It was 400 and, um, oh, sorry. Do you have this? I'm just oh, asking. Yeah, I, I don't remember the total high school. I've had it because I didn't operate it out that way, but 533. We were 577, I believe. So about 40. 40 so I think it was 44 students. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. So so that count was down a little bit. Um, and then, you know, in the normal situation, I'd come to you and say, okay, well, now we've lost 29 FTE, 23 FTE. That's going to be a budget cut. But the other little uh, caveat that happened is that, um, you know, we also add in open enrollment out students. And historically, like the, the, for the previous two years that I've, I've been in front of you doing this, um, we have a count on the third Friday count date, and then it continues to grow over the next several months to what we kind of end up, you know, toward the end of the year. But last year we had 199 students that were able to count, but we ended up with 248. So there was, you know, 50 students joined us over the course of the year. This year, the count date uh, on the count date we had 224. So we offset some of that loss by just having those extra open enrollment students around. So, so that helped. Now, what I don't know is if that means that we have another 30 or 40 students still coming, and it will be 260, or whether the schools involved just uh, were reporting it more accurately and faster, so that we we, we have it. So. Uh, I don't know, but that again, we, we've been able to offset some of that loss. And then as well, we um, also had a little higher uh, participation in summer school this year. We added a couple of FTE through that. So then by the time you do all of that and do the three-year average, our FTE only dropped by one from what I had presented to you at the annual meeting. So that was a $12,500 reduction. We'll you know handle that budgetarily. That won't be an issue. Um, but it just meant that we didn't you know, sometimes we get lucky and we have all these extra students and we know we have more money to spend, we will not have more money to spend um, this year. So that'll be the, the revenue limit needs um, for a fund 10. Okay. Any questions about the resident enrollment piece? Okay. Um, and then open enrollment in um, is also down a little bit. Uh, we had um, 57, um, we projected a total of 57 open enrollment seats this year based on uh, returning students and then the, the, the seats we added. Uh, but we actually lost five students, and some of the students that we have are not um, special needs, so the revenue changes between those two categories. So we're going to uh, lose a little bit of revenue there, so I'll be making that adjustment as well. Um, that's outside of the revenue limit and not part of the um, FTE calculation for revenue purposes, but it is another piece that, where we add additional funds that, that we would get for other districts. So um, I'll be making that little tweak as well, so that drops us um, a small amount. And then the bigger thing which has happened, um, which is a kind of a result of the audit. So I'm, we're still finalizing the 2022-23 audit, some um, going through some pieces. And one of the things, and if you have a change in audit companies, you sometimes have a change in philosophy, a change in way you know things read. Um, it's like attorneys, different attorneys can see the same thing and have different you know opinions on what might be. So um, our our auditors were concerned about um, our use of Fund 80 for our school resource officer. Um, when we originally started using the school resource officer, um, that was paid out of Fund 10. And then at one point in 2019, 2020, in that school year, it moved to Fund 80. Um, some districts have been able to do that, but I think it depends on how the agreement is worded with the, um, you know, with the uh, police department that you're uh, working with. 
And because our agreement, which I had to send to the auditors for them to review, um, uh, because our agreement dictates that the school resource officer will be here on school days during certain times of the day, it's basically a school expense and it's not a community expense. So they have, they have uh, asked us and uh, basically requested us and made us move it back to fund 10 from fund 80. Um, so that's not only for, uh, you know, last year, um, it'll be going forward as well. So that's now a shift that I'm going to have to do in our budgeting and that the roughly $68,000 that we spend um, we're planning on spending this year for that position. We'll have to come out of fund 10 uh, and under a revenue limit versus fund 80 and a separate tax levy. Mm -hmm. um, I can't really speak to why uh, in, in the two years that we had the previous auditors, um, they never brought it to our attention or were concerned by it. Again, sometimes it's an interpretation thing, whether they looked at it or not, I don't know. They always ask you what's in fund 80 and what are you paying for out of it? And I tell them um, and whether they um, knew or didn't know or were concerned or focused on other things, I can't say. Um, but the result of that is that, you know, we'll be shifting those costs back over to fund 10. So um, we'll certainly, uh, and, and the, you know, the village budgets on a calendar year basis. So um, if, if it's a consideration, the board will have to revisit how that contract works. We may have to talk to the village, you know, next year in anticipation for the following year. Um, but for now, we'll just have to address it um, with the funds that we have. So. Yes, Ms. Peterson. Um, the auditors show you in any type of informative information on where it says that from DPI on how this should be allocated? I haven't determined that. They didn't share the other information. They basically said that it, it, the, the rules are written as such. And, and I have, I've heard rumblings that a, a lot of districts, I think some, at certain points, districts were trying to put it in fund 80 and then it, it would end up getting moved back either through DPI or through the through audit, auditor requests. Um, again, because our situation hadn't been, you know, it wasn't even questioned. You know, if, if somebody would have said, ah, I don't know, you might want to talk about this, look at it, it would have been on my radar, but, you know, it wasn't. And it wasn't until last week that it was questioned. And so, I certainly um, think that it wouldn't kill you. No, yeah, I can so certainly reach out and, and, and confirm. Absolutely. That, that, so that you have it documented. Right. And you can read it and be comfortable for yourself. Absolutely. But absolutely. Obviously, we have to do what they request us to do. Because what is it's going to be in the testing entry in your in this year? In, in just the entry, yeah, in, in, in 22, 23. So what that means is, and I, I as I mentioned in the in the uh, summary, it basically means like we we had levied seventy five thousand dollars or one hundred twenty five thousand dollars last year in fund eighty. So that's sixty five or whatever it is. Come out of that and going that, to operate. it goes operation. So it's gonna it's gonna um, reduce our surplus. So we have funds available in fund ten from last year. Uh, be less than fund balance, but that means there's going to be a fund balance in fund 80. Yeah. Um, and this year, especially because between the CLC program, which is funded through um, a federal grant, and our after school programs in both the middle and high school have that special one year grant, I don't have a lot of things to spend in fund 80. Um, so I, you know, we'll have a fund balance there. So I'll probably be proposing a zero dollar levy for fund 80, and we'll just, you know, start to draw it down a little bit. Next year, um, any after school program we do for the middle school or high school would come out of that fund. Again, um, we try to do it that way. So that would, um, maybe we would need to add back to the levy, but um, it would mean that we're, you know, we'd be able to at least reduce the total levy by a little bit. We're going to have to then though squeeze in that, that uh, $68,000 out of our operational um, uh, uh, budget going forward. Sure. So we'll see how that shakes out as I make all the other adjustments um, with the revenue limit and other pieces. Yeah. Thank you. And our SO, and we pay SRO, was it, how much is it again? We'll uh, I believe this year I budget $68,000. It's a small escalator, and then we're paying 50% of the cost to the village. Um, what, they, what they did clarify then, too, is that, um, and I have to verify what I will confirm as a community event, but we have had situations we've had to have um, Brown Deer Police here working overtime to, um, you know, do crowd control for sporting events occasionally. And especially if it's a WIA thing, I think we can, those costs could get moved to Fund 80 and we could pay for it out of that. Um, whether we could do it for our own events when we have, you know, a rival coming in and we feel like there's a potential, which we've had, you know, we had a few situations last year, we just wanted to have extra presence available. Um, if that's the case, maybe those costs are also included because they're outside of the normal school day. Um, but I'll be getting verification on that as well. Thank you. Okay.
All right. Well, then, if that's uh, there are no other questions on those, again, this is just the, a precursor, just so you're not surprised. Uh, but the rest of the information will be coming in a couple of weeks. That sounds good. All right. Uh, let's go on to item number three: uh, engaged learners. Uh, is that Dr. Kelsey Brown? Yes. This is uh, informational. Um, Dr. Benjamin had asked about the specifics of parent teacher practices last time we met. And um, it is listed here for you. October 18th is in person, both buildings. Um, 3.30 to 7.30, Middle High School, PDE 4 to 8, October 18th. And then on the 19th, virtual hybrid option, um, 4 to 8 at the Middle High School, and then 4 to 8 um, at the Elementary School. And there are some parents, um, there are teachers who will take their virtual requests here in the building. And so if parents want to come in for an in-person option as well, there, we make that available to our parents. So we are looking forward to parent-teacher conferences next week. Seems like it came fairly quickly here. <laughs> yeah. I got my appointments with no trouble. Next work doesn't awesome. Go well, IT. There it is. We're learning. It's annexed. We're learning. Board members, any questions for Dr. Kelsey Brown in relationship to parent teacher conferences? All right. Thank you very much. Let's go on to item number four uh, engage and innovative staff, uh, the parent and staff engagement uh, survey. Yes. Uh, we are contracting with School Perceptions, an uh, organization who disseminates uh, surveys for parents, and staff, and students of these chose to go that route. Uh, the survey went out on Monday, October 2nd. Uh, to date, we have 109 staff members who have completed the survey and 245 parents have completed the survey. We will uh, send out reminders. Um, and then once uh, it closes on October 20th, I believe, and then we will um, begin to look at our data and bring information to you regarding what our next step should be. Um, to be responsive to the survey data. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. I'm sorry, you say you sent me uh, reminders? Yes. Okay. This went out to the parents and to the staff. Correct. Okay. All right. Let's go on to now item number five, uh, Gage Board and Community uh, to Lead, Discussion of Organizational Audit. Yes. Um, there was an executive summary that was posted on the uh, on the organizational audit. Um, we started a conversation, I believe, in July regarding the organizational audit, and um, our intent was to go with um, CISO 5, and um, the summary uh, states uh, CISO 5 feels like they're not in a position, ha they have determined that they're not in a position to take us on um, at this time to conduct the organizational audit. They have unsecured um, contracts with several other districts in between July and now. Um, and so they believe that they are, um, that they would not be able to add that to their workload at this time. I did call Dr. Bill and ask him if they would reconsider at some point. Um, he said, yes, they would. Just, they just don't know when um, because of all of the other contracts they secured in between July and October um, to do this work. So, um, I bring this to you this evening um, to understand what's your pleasure from the next sex. CISA 5 is the only CISA that does it? Um, that I'm aware of. Um, I've never known CISA 1 to do uh, organizational audits. We can ask. <laughs> uh, we can ask. Uh, see who else might be out there and bring that information to you. This was the one that came to be recalled from Wendy, um, one who helps us with our district administrative evaluation. Um, she had done it in her district when she was a superintendent. But we can put some fillers out there and see what other CISAs might do. I don't know how many CISAs there are, but uh, is it 12? 12. 12, 12 CISAs, okay. Yeah. So we can we can see if it is. This is one of those things like payroll is one that like we use CISA 5 for payroll, but there's only, I think, CISA 9 or 10 is the only other one that does it. Okay, so. Some of the you know, all, activities yeah. all, you know, they, they kind of focus on certain things that they're, you know, like see six to all the educator effectiveness and that's kind of their bread and butter, so to so, so different. All right. All right, let's go on to item number B, strategic uh, plan. Uh, yes, the uh, board member, you all submitted questions to us uh, a couple weeks back. Uh, we put those questions on the Google Doc. 
and sent them to everyone. So all of you should have those, the answers, the responses to the questions in your possession. Um, thank you to Dr. Glass for her leadership. Uh, she asked if we should reach out to the three of you to make sure that we're all on the same page and seek clarity um, around those questions. So thank you, Lita, for meeting with us, for making it work. Yeah. <laughs> we know you're at a school too and got to make things work. And Dorinthia and Dr. Vito for meeting with us individually. Um, and so if there aren't any other questions, um, we believe that we have accomplished that in terms of you know, responding to those questions. What we'd like to do is um, work, we're going to work on your part, Dorinthia, in terms of the timeline, to just adding that to those opportunities for improvement. Um, and our goal would be to bring this to the board um, for approval of the strategic plan um, at the end of this month. That be our goal. So would that be for the regular board meeting? The regular board. Okay. All right. Let's make there. sure that we put that on for the uh, agenda. Fine. Okay. All right. Unless there are any other questions that you have for us to be responsive to. Oh, board members, any other questions? I really like how that kind of worked out to be able to get the uh, questions to ask and a little bit of clarity in relationship to that and stuff. So I really think that was a really good process okay. in so, place to be able to get those questions answered rather than here in open form. Sure. So, yeah. All right, let's move on to. All right, um, let's go on to item number six. Man. That's not on your agenda. Oh, I saw that. All right, so let's go to item six. Uh, so I want to make a motion to go into closed session. Dr. Vito, I would like to make a motion to enter into closed session to discuss district administrator evaluation and to consider strategic strategy for crime detection or prevention pursuant to Wisconsin State Statutes 19.851C3. All right. Motion has been made. We have a second. Second. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Walker. Motion is made. And I say, uh, any other discussion? No. Oh, well, she can't be a part of this party. Right. All right. Yeah. So with that being said, um, Ms. Ashley, roll call vote. Yes. Vito. Aye. Ashley, aye. Baker. Peterson. Aye. Robinson. Aye. 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 The vote is six to zero. All right. Closed session. At six thirty-three p.m. All right. Uh, we will probably will not be coming back in open session. So everyone that's in attendance with us, the public, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to come. Oh, that's a, it's brief. <laughs> for this for this very brief meeting, and thank you very much, and enjoy the remainder of your evening. And good night. Well, that's a testament.